everybody. Hi, Mazara. Hi, Karen Mueller. Can you guys hear me okay? I hope everyone's doing really well today, tonight. We had a really big day as far as a lot of news coming in from hey, tonight. Oh, that's not We it. had a really big day. <laughs> um, we had a big day as far as um, true crime. And we got word that it's been confirmed that Brian Laundrie's body has been identified. So my thoughts are with the Petito Schmidt family tonight because I'm sure it's devastating for them. So um, prayers going up to that family and they said that they'll speak when they can get themselves together and let everybody know um, how they feel. Thanks for joining us, Elizabeth Osborne, Caitlin. Hi. Yeah, it's really sad. Um, and then we had Larry Miliate's arraignment today. So for those of you who don't, who aren't here because of true crime, I apologize. Just doing a little bit of hello and because uh, once I start, so I don't interrupt the flow, I try not to engage with chat so that people can just, when they're listening to the book, can just put it on play, go to bed or whatever they want to do. Um, so I haven't read Fight Club since 1999. So there'll probably be mistakes because it's live. Sometimes on the playbacks, I feel people might not realize I'm doing this live. <laughs> so it is live. There will be, um, you know, maybe a dog snoring, stuff like that. So that will happen. And we will do about two hours. And this will probably be, I want to say four parts, but it can be three parts. It might be a little bit faster read than lullaby. So we'll see. And my chair is making this really amazing noise. I'm being sarcastic, but yeah. Hi, Anna Brown. Hi, California Thunder. Hi, Dark Sea. Thank you guys for being here. Okay, so I'm going to start. And um, everyone relax and get your favorite snack or your favorite comfy clothes on. And let's get into this book and see where this journey takes us today. Tyler gets me a job as a waiter. After that, Tyler's pushing a gun in my mouth and saying, the first step to eternal life is you have to die. For a long time, though, Tyler and I were best friends. People are always asking, did I know about Tyler Durden? The barrel of the gun pressed against the back of my throat. Tyler says, we really won't die. With my tongue, I can feel the silencer holes we drilled into the barrel of the gun. Most of the noise a, shot, a gunshot makes is expanding gases. And there's a tiny sonic boom a bullet makes because it travels so fast. To make a silencer, you just drill holes in the barrel of the gun. A lot of holes. This lets, this lets the gas escape and slows the bullet to below the speed of sound. You drill the holes wrong and the gun will blow off your hand. This isn't really death, Tyler says. We'll be legend. We won't grow old. I tongue the barrel into my cheek and say, Tyler, you're thinking of vampires. The building we're standing on won't be here in 10 minutes. You take a 98% concentration of fuming nitric acid and add the acid to three times that amount of sulfuric acid. Do this in an ice bath, then add glycerin drop by drop with an eyedropper. You have nitroglycerin. I know this because Tyler knows this. 
Mix the nitro with sawdust and you have a nice plastic explosive. A lot of folks mix their nitro with cotton and add Epsom salts as a sulfate. This works too. Some folks, they use paraffin mixed with nitro. Paraffin has never, ever worked for me. So Tyler and I are on top of the Parker Morris building with a gun stuck in my mouth and we hear glass breaking. Look over the edge. It's a cloudy day, even this high up. This is the world's tallest building and this high up, the wind is always cold. It's so quiet this high up. The feeling you get is that you're one of those space monkeys. You do the little job you're trained to do. Pull a lever, push a button. You don't understand any of it, and then you just die. 191 floors up, and you look over the edge of the roof, and the street below is mottled with a shag carpet of people standing, looking up. The breaking glass is a window right below us. A window blows out the side of the building and then comes a file cabinet, big as a black refrigerator. Right below us, a six drawer filing cabinet drops right out of the cliff face of the building and drops turning slowly and drops getting smaller and drops disappearing into the packed crowd. Somewhere in the 191 floors under us, the space monkeys and the mischief committee of Project Mayhem are running wild, destroying every scrap of history. That old saying, how you always kill the one you love, will look at it both ways. With a gun stuck in your mouth and the barrel of the gun between your teeth, you can only talk in vowels. We're down to our last 10 minutes. Another window blows out of the building and glass sprays out. Sparkling flock of pigeon style and then a dark wooden desk pushed by mischief committee emerges inch by inch from the side of the building until the desk tilts and slides and churns end over end into a magic flying thing lost in the crowd. The Parker Morris building won't be here in nine minutes. You take enough blasting gelatin and wrap the foundation columns of anything. You can topple any building in the world. You have to tamp it with, you have to tamp it good and tight with sandbags so the blast goes against the column and not out into the parking garage around the column. This how to how to stuff isn't in any history book. The three ways to make napalm. One, you can mix equal parts of gasoline and frozen orange juice concentrate. Two, you can mix equal parts of gasoline and diet cola. Three, you can dissolve crumbled cat litter in gasoline until the mixture is thick. Ask me how to make nerve gas. Oh, all those crazy car bombs. Nine minutes. The Parker Morris building will go over all 191 floors, slow as a tree falling into the forest. Timber, you can topple anything. It's weird to think the place where we're standing will only be a point in the sky. Tyler and me at the edge of the roof, the gun in my mouth. I'm wondering how clean is this gun? We just totally forget about Tyler's whole murder suicide thing while we watch another file cabinet slip out the side of the building and the drawers roll open midair. Reams of white paper caught in the updraft and carried off on the wind. Eight minutes. Then the smoke. Smoke starts out of the broken windows. 
The demolition team will hit the primary charge in maybe eight minutes. The primary charge will blow the base charge. The foundation columns will, will crumble and the photo series of the Parker Morris building will go into all the history books. The five picture time lapse series. Here are the buildings standing. Second picture, the building will be at an 80 degree angle, then a 70 degree angle. The building's at a 45 degree angle in the fourth picture when the skeleton starts to give and the tower gets a slight arch to it. The last shot, the tower, all 191 floors will slam down on the National Museum, which is Tyler's real target. This is our world now, our world, Tyler says, and those ancient people are dead. If I knew how this was all going to turn out, I'd be more than happy to be dead and in heaven right now. Seven minutes. Up on top of the Parker Morris building with Tyler's gun in my mouth, while desks and filing cabinets and computers meteor down on the crowd around the building and smoke funnels up from the broken windows. And the three blocks down the street, the demolition team watches the clock. All I know, I know all of this. The gun, the anarchy, the explosion is really about Marla Singer. Six minutes. We have sort of a triangle thing going on here. I want Tyler, Tyler wants Marla, Marla wants me. I don't want Marla and Tyler doesn't want me around, not anymore. This isn't about love as in caring. This is about property as in ownership. Without Marla, Tyler would have nothing. Five minutes. Maybe we would become a legend. Maybe not. No, I say, but wait. Where would Jesus be if no one had written the Gospels? Four minutes. I tongue the gun barrel into my cheek and say, You want to be a legend, Tyler? Man, I'll make you a legend. I have been here from the beginning. I remember everything. Three minutes. Bob's big arms were closed around to hold me inside, and I was squeezed in the dark between Bob's new sweating tits that hang enormous, the way we think of God's as big. Going around the church basement full of men, each night we met. This is Art. This is Paul. This is Bob. Bob's big shoulders make me think of the horizon. Bob's thick blonde hair was what you get when hair cream calls itself sculpting mousse. So thick and blonde and the part is so straight. His arms wrapped around me. Bob's hand palms my head against the new tits sprouted on his barrel chest. It'll be all right, Bob says. You cry now. From my knees to my forehead, I feel chemical reactions within Bob burning food and oxygen. Maybe they got it all early enough, Bob says. Maybe it's just seminoma. With seminoma, you have almost 100% survival rate. Bob's shoulders inhale themselves up in a long draw, then drop, drop, drop in jerking sobs, draw themselves up, drop, drop, drop. I've been coming here every week for two years, and every week Bob wraps his arms around me, and I cry. You cry, Bob says, and inhales and sobs, sobs, sobs. Go on now and cry. The big wet face settles down on top of my head and I am lost inside. This is when I'd cry. Crying is right at hand in the smothering dark. 
closed inside someone else, when you see how everything you can ever accomplish will end up as trash, anything you, you're ever proud of will be thrown away, and I'm lost inside. This is as close as I've been to sleeping in almost a week. This is how I met Marla Singer. Bob cries because six months ago, his testicles were removed, then hormone support therapy. Bob has tits because his testosterone rip ration is too high. Raise the testosterone level too much, your body ups the estrogen to seek a balance. This is when I'd cry because right now your life comes down to nothing and not even nothing. Oblivion. Too much estrogen and you get bitch tits. It's easy to cry when you realize that everyone you love will reject you or die. On a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone will drop to zero. Bob loves me because he thinks my testicles were removed too. Around us in the Trinity Episcopalian basement with the thrift store plaid sofas are maybe 20 men and only one woman. All of them clung together in pairs, most of them crying. Some pairs lean forward, heads pressed ear to ear, the way wrestlers stand, locked. The man with the only woman plants his elbows on her shoulders, one elbow on either side of her head, her head between his hands and his face crying against her neck. The woman's face twists off to one side and her hand brings up a cigarette. I peek out from under the armpit of Big Bob. All my life, Bob cries, why I do anything I don't know. The only woman here is remaining men together. The only woman here at remaining men together, the testicular cancer support group. This woman smokes her cigarette under the burden of a stranger and her eyes come together with mine. Faker, faker, faker. Short matte black hair, big eyes the way they are in Japanese animation. Skim milk thin, buttermilk sallow in her dress with a wallpaper pattern of dark roses. This woman was also in my tuberculosis support group Friday night. She was in my melanoma round table Wednesday night. Monday night, she was in my firm believers leukemia wrap group. The part down the center of her hair is a crooked lightning bolt of white scalp. When you look for these support groups, they all have vague, upbeat names. My Thursday evening group for blood parasites, it's called Free and Clear. The group, the group I go to for brain parasites is called Above and Beyond. And Sunday afternoon at Remaining Men Together in the basement of Trinity Episcopal, this woman is here again. Worse than that, I can't cry with her watching. This should be my favorite part, being held and crying with Big Bob without hope. We all work so hard all the time. This is the only place I really ever relax and give up. This is my vacation. I went to my first support group two years ago after I'd gone to a doctor about my insomnia again. Three weeks and I hadn't slept. Three weeks without sleep and everything becomes an out-of-body experience. My doctor said, Insomnia is just the symptom of something larger. Find out what's actually wrong. Listen to your body. I just wanted to sleep. I wanted little blue amatol sodium capsules, 200 milligram size. I wanted red and blue two and all bullet capsules, lipstick red second alls. My doctor told me to chew valerian root and get more exercise. Eventually, I'd fall asleep. The bruised, old fruit way my face had collapsed, you, wouldn't, you would have thought I was dead. My doctor said, if I wanted to see real pain, I should swing by the first you, you, you craced, the first you craced on a Tuesday night. 
See the brain parasites. See the degenerative bone diseases, the organic brain dysfunctions. See the cancer patients getting by. So I went. The first group I went to, there were introductions. This is Alice, this is Brenda, this is Dover. Everyone smiles with that invisible gun to their head. I never give my real name at support groups. The little skeleton of a woman named Chloe with the seat of her pants hanging down, sad and empty. Chloe tells me the worst thing about her brain parasites was no one would have sex with her. Here she was, so close to death that her life insurance policy had paid off with 75,000 bucks. And all Chloe wanted was to get laid for the last time. Not intimacy, sex. What does a guy say? What can you say, I mean? All this dying had started with Chloe being a little tired and now Chloe was too bored to go in for treatment. Pornographic movies. She had pornographic movies at home in her apartment. During the French Revolution, Chloe told me, the women in prison, the duchesses, baronesses, marquises, whatever, they would screw any man who'd climb on top. Chloe breathed against my neck. Climb on top. Pony up. Did I know? Screwing past the time. La petite mort the French called it. Chloe had pornographic movies, if I was interested. Emile nitrate lubricants. Normal times, I'd be sporting an erection. Our Chloe, however, is a skeleton dipped in yellow wax. Chloe looking the way she is, I am nothing. Not even nothing. Still, Chloe's shoulders poke mine when we sit around in circle on the shag carpet. We close our eyes. This was Chloe's turn to lead us in a guided meditation, and she talked us into the Garden of Serenity. Chloe talked us up the hill to the Palace of Seven Doors. Inside the palace were the seven doors, the green door, the yellow door, the orange door. And Chloe talked us through opening each door, the blue door, the red door, the white door, door and finding what was there. Eyes closed, we imagined our pain as a ball of white healing light floating around our feet and rising to our knees, our waist, our chest, our chakras opening, the heart chakra, the head chakra. Chloe talked us into caves where we met our power animal. Mine was a penguin. Ice covered the floor of the cave and the penguin said, slide. Without any effort, we slid through the tunnels and galleries. Then it was time to hug. Open your eyes. This was therapeutic physical contact, Chloe said. We should all choose a partner. Chloe threw herself around my head and cried. She had strapless underwear at home and cried. Chloe had oils and handcuffs and cried as I watched the second hand on my watch go around 11 times. So I didn't cry at my first support group two years ago. I didn't cry at my second or my third support group either. I didn't cry at blood parasites or bowel cancers or organic brain dementia. This is how it is with insomnia. Everything is so far away, a copy of a copy of a copy. The insomnia distance of everything. You can't touch anything and nothing can touch you. Then there was Bob. The first time I went to testicular cancer, Bob, the big moosey, the big cheese bread, moved in on top of me and remaining men together and started crying. The big moosey tread, tread right across the room when it was hug time, his arms at his sides, his shoulders rounded, his big moosey chin on his chest, his eyes already shrink wrapped in tears, shuffling his feet knees together in visible steps. Bob slid across the basement floor to heave himself to me. Bob pancaked down on me. Bob's big arms wrapped around me. Big Bob was a juicer, he said. All those salad days on Diana Bowl, 
and then the racehorse steroid withdrawal, his own gym, Big Bob owned a gym. He'd been married three times. He'd done product endorsements. And had I seen him on television ever? The whole how-to program about expanding your chest was practically his invention. Strangers with this kind of honesty make me go a big rubbery one, if you know what I mean. Bob didn't know. Maybe only one of his huevos had ever descended, and he knew this was a risk factor. Bob told me about post-operative hormone therapy. A lot of bodybuilders shooting too much testosterone would get what they called bitch tits. I had to ask Bob, I had to ask what Bob meant by huevos. Huevos, Bob said, gonads, nuts, jewels, testes, balls. In Mexico, where you buy your steroids, they call them eggs. Divorce, 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 Bob said, and showed me a wallet photo of himself huge and naked at first glance in a posing strap at some contest. It's a stupid way to live, Bob said, but when you're pumped and shaved on stage, totally shredded with body fat down to around 2% and the diuretics leave you cold and hard as concrete to, to concrete to touch, you're blind from the lights and deaf from the feedback rush of the sound system until the judge orders, extend your right quad, flex and hold. Extend your left arm. Flex the bicep and hold. This is better than real life. Fast forward, Bob said to the cancer. Then he went bankrupt. He had two grown kids who wouldn't return his calls. The cure for bitch tits was for the doctor to cut up under the pectorials and drain any fluid. This was all I remember because then Bob was closing in around me with his arms and his head was folding down to cover me. Then I was lost inside oblivion, dark and silent and complete. And when I finally stepped away from his soft chest, the front of Bob's shirt was a wet mask of how I looked crying. That was two years ago at my first night with remaining men together. At almost every meeting since then, Big Bob has made me cry. I never went back to the doctor. I never chewed the valerian root. This was freedom. Losing all hope was freedom. If I didn't say anything, people in a group assumed the worst. They cried harder. I cried harder. I looked up into the stars and you're gone. Walking home after a support group, I felt more alive than I'd ever felt. It wasn't host to cancer or blood par I wasn't host to cancer or blood parasites. I was the little warm center that the life of the world crowded around. And I slept. Babies don't sleep this well. Every evening I died, and every evening I was born, resurrected. Until tonight. Two years of success until tonight because I can't cry with this woman watching me because I can't hit bottom. I can't be saved. My tongue thinks it is flocked wallpaper. I'm biting the inside of my mouth so much. I haven't slept in four days. With her watching, I'm a liar. She's a fake. She's the liar. At the introductions tonight, we introduced ourselves. I'm Bob, I'm Paul, I'm Terry, I'm David. I never give my real name. This is cancer, right? She said. Then she said, well, hi, I'm Marla Singer. Nobody ever told Marla what kind of cancer. Then we were all busy cradling our inner child. The man still crying against her neck. Marla takes another drag on her cigarette. I watch her from between Bob's sh shuddering tits. To Marla, I'm a fake. Since the second night I saw her, I can't sleep. Still, I was the first fake, unless 
maybe all these people are faking with their lesions and their coughs and tumors. Even Big Bob, the big moosey, the big cheese bread. Would you just look at his sculpted hair? Marla smokes and rolls her eyes now. In this one moment, Marla's lie reflects my lie. And all I can see are lies. In the middle of all their truth, everyone clinging and risking to share their worst fear, that their death is coming head on and the barrel of a gun is pressed against the back of their throats. But Marla is smoking and rolling her eyes. And me, I'm buried under a sobbing carpet. And all of a sudden, even death and dying rink right down there with plastic flowers on video at a non-event. Bob, I say, you're crushing me. I try to whisper, then I don't. Bob, I try to keep my voice down and then I'm yelling. Bob, I have to go to the can. A mirror hangs over the sink in the bathroom. If the pattern holds, I'll see Marla Singer at Above and Beyond, the parasitic brain dysfunction group. Marla will be there. Of course, Marla will be there. And what I'll do is sit next to her. And after the introductions and the guided medica meditation, the seven doors of the palace, the white healing ball of light, after we open our chakras, when it comes time to hug, I'll grab the little bitch. Her arms squeeze tight against her sides and my lips pressed against her ear, I'll say, Marla, you big fake, you get out. This is the one real thing in my life and you're wrecking it, you big tourist. The next time we meet, I'll say, Marla, I can't sleep with you here. I need this, get out. You wake up at Air Harbor International. Every takeoff and landing, when the plane banked too much to one side, I prayed for a crash. That moment cures my insomnia with narcolepsy when we might die helpless and packed human tobacco in the fuselage. This is how I met Tyler Durden. You wake up at O'Hare, you wake up at LaGuardia, you wake up at Logan. Tyler worked part-time as a movie projectionist. Because of his nature, Tyler could only work night jobs. If a projectionist called in sick, the union called Tyler. Some people are night people. Some people are day people. I could only work a day job. You wake up in Dulles. Life insurance pays off triple if you die on a business trip. I prayed for wind shear effect. I prayed for pelicans sucked into the turbines and loose bolts and ice on the wings. On takeoff, as the plane pushed down the runway and the flaps tilted up with our seats in their full upright position and our tray tables stowed and all personal carry-on baggage in the overhead compartment, as the end of the runway ran up to meet us with our smoking materials extinguished, I prayed for a crash. You wake up at Love Field. In a projection booth, Tyler did changeovers if the theater was old enough. With changeovers, you have two project projectors in the booth and one projector is running. I know this because Tyler knows this. The second projector is set up with the next reel of film. Most movies are six or seven small reels of film played in a certain order. Newer theaters, they splice all the reels together into one five-foot reel. This way, you don't have to run two projectors and do changeovers. Switch back and forth, reel one, switch. Reel two on the other projector, switch. Reel three on the first projector, switch. You wake up at SeaTac. I study the people on the laminated airline seat card. A woman floats in the ocean with her brown hair spread out behind her, her seat cushion clutched to her chest. The eyes are wide open, but the woman doesn't smile or frown. 
In another picture, people calm as Hindu cows reach up from their seats towards oxygen masks sprung out of the ceiling. This must be an emergency. Oh, we've lost cabin pressure. Oh, you wake up and you're at Willow Run. Old theater, new theater. To ship a movie to the next theater, Tyler has to break the movie back down to the original six or seven reels. The small reels packed into a pair of hexagonal steel suitcases. Each suitcase has a handle on top. Pick one up and you'll dislocate a shoulder. They weigh that much. Tyler's a banquet waiter, waiting tables at a hotel downtown. And Tyler's a projectionist with the projector operators union. I don't know how long Tyler has been working on all those nights I couldn't sleep. The old theaters that run a movie with two projectors, a projectionist has to stand right there to change the projectors at the exact second so the audience never sees the break when one reel starts and one reel ran out. You have to look for the white dots at the top right hand corner of the screen. This is a warning. Watch the movie and you'll see two dots at the end of a reel. Cigarette burns, they're called in the business. The first white dot is the two minute warning. You get the second projector started so it will be running up to speed. The second white dot is the five second warning. Excitement. You're standing between the two projectors and the booth is sweating hot from the Xeon, from the Exxon light bulbs that you looked right down at them. And if you looked right down at them, you're blind. The first dot flashes on the screen. The sound in the movie comes from a big speaker behind the screen. The projectionist booth is soundproof because inside the booth is a racket of sprockets, snapping film past the lens at six feet a second, 10 frames a foot, 60 frames a second, snapping through, clattering, glackling gunfire. The two projectors running, you stand between and hold the shutter lever on each. On really old projectors, you have an alarm on the hub of the feed reel. Even after the movies on television, the warning dots will still be there, even on airplane movies. As most of the movie rolls onto the take-up reel, the take-up reel trims slower and the feed reel has to turn faster. At the end of the reel, the feed reel turns so fast, the alarm will start ringing to warn you that a changeover is coming up. The dark is hot from the bulbs inside the projectors and the alarm is ringing. Stand there between the two projectors with a lever in each hand and watch the corner of the screen. The second dot flashes, count to five. Switch one shutter closed. At the same time, open the other shutter. Change over. The movie goes on. Nobody in the audience has any idea. The alarm is on the feed reel so the movie projectionist can nap. A movie projectionist does a lot he's not supposed to. Not every projector has the alarm. At home, you'll sometimes wake up in your dark bed with the terror you've fallen asleep at the booth and missed a changeover. The audience will be cursing you. The audience, their movie dream is ruined and the manager will be calling the union. You wake up at Chrissy Field. The charm of traveling is everywhere I go, tiny life. I go to the hotel, tiny soap, tiny shampoos single serving butter, tiny mouthwash and a single use toothbrush. Fold into the standard airplane seat. You're a giant. The problem is your shoulders are too big. Your Alice in Wonderland legs are all of a sudden miles so long they touch the front. They touch the feet of the person in front. Dinner arrives, a miniature do-it-yourself chicken cordon bleu hobby cake sort of a put it together project to keep you busy. The pilot has turned on the seatbelt sign and we would ask you to refrain from moving about the cabin. 
you wake up at Meg's field. Sometimes Tyler wakes up in the dark buzzing with the terror that he's missed a real change or the movie has broken or the movie has slipped just enough in the projector that the sprockets are pinching a line of holes through the soundtrack. After a movie has been sprocket run, the light of the bulb shines through the soundtrack and instead of talk, you're blasted with the helicopter blade sound of whoop, whoop, whoop as each burst of light comes through a sprocket hole. What else a projectionist shouldn't do? Tyler makes slides out of the best single frames from a movie. The first full frontal movie anyone can remember had the naked actress Angie Dickinson. By the time a print of this movie had shipped from the West Coast theaters to the East Coast theaters, the nude scene was gone. One projectionist took a frame. Another projectionist took a frame. Everybody wanted to make a naked slide of Angie Dickinson. Porno got into the theaters and these projectionists, some guys they built collections that got epic. You wake up at Boeing Field. You wake up at LAX. We have an almost empty flight tonight, so feel free to fold the armrests up into the seat backs and stretch out. So you stretch out, zig zigzag knees bent, waist bent, elbows bent across three or four seats. I set my watch two hours earlier or three hours later, Pacific, Mountain, Central, or Eastern time, lose an hour, gain an hour. This is your life and it's ending one minute at a time. You wake up at Cleveland Hopkins. You wake up at SeaTac again. You're a projectionist and you're tired and angry, but mostly you're bored. So you start by taking a single frame of pornography collected by some projectionist that you find stashed away in the booth. And you splice this frame into a lunging red penis or a yawning wet vagina close up into another feature movie. This is one of the those pet adventures when the dog and cat are left behind by a traveling family and must find their way home. In real three, just after the dog and cat who have human voices and talk to each other have eaten out of the garbage can, there's a flash and an erection. Tyler does this. A single frame in a movie is on the screen for one sixteenth of a second. Divide a second into 60 equal parts. That's how long the erection is. Towering four stories tall over the popcorn auditorium. Slippery red and terrible and no one sees it. You wake up at Logan again. This is a terrible way to travel. I go to meetings my boss doesn't want to attend. I take notes. I'll get back to you. Wherever I'm going, I'll be there to apply the formula. I'll keep the secret intact. It's simple arithmetic. It's a story problem. If a new car built by my company leaves Chicago traveling west at 60 miles per hour and the rear differential locks up and the car crashes and burns with everyone trapped inside, does my company initiate a recall? You take the population of vehicles in the field, A, and multiply it by problem rate of failure, by problem, by probable rate of failure, B, then multiply the result by the average cost of an out-of-court settlement, C. A times B times C equals X. This is what it will cost if we don't initiate a recall. If X is greater than the cost of a recall, we recall the cars and no one gets hurt. If X is less than the cost of a recall, then we don't recall. Everywhere I go, there's the burned up, wadded up shell of a car waiting for me. I know where all the skeletons are. Consider this my job security. Hotel, hotel time, restaurant food. Everywhere I go, I make tiny friendships with the people sitting beside me from Logan to Chrissy to Willow Run. What I am is a recall campaign coordinator. I tell the single serving friend sitting next to me, 
but I'm working toward a career as a dishwasher. And you wake up at O'Hare again. Tyler sliced a penis into everything after that, usually close-ups or a Grand Canyon vagina with an echo. Four stories tall and twitching with blood pressure as Cinderella danced with her Prince Charming and people watched. Nobody complained. People ate and drank, but the evening wasn't the same. People felt sick or started to cry and don't know why. Only a hummingbird could have caught Tyler at work. You wake up at JFK. I melt and swell at the moment of landing when one wheel thuds on the runway, but the plane leans to one side and hangs in the decision to right itself or roll. For this moment, nothing matters. Look up into the stars and you're gone. Not your luggage. Nothing matters. Not your bad breath. Your windows are dark outside and the turbine engines roar backward. The cabin hangs at the wrong angle under the roar of the turbines and you will never have to file another expense account claim. Receipt required for items over $25. You will never have to get another haircut. A thud and the second wheel hits the tarmac. A hundred seat belts buckle snapping open and a single use friend you almost died sitting next to says, I hope you make your connection. Yeah, me too. And this is how long your moment lasted and life goes on. And somehow by accident, Tyler and I met. It was time for a vacation. You wake up at LAX again. How I met Tyler was I went to a nude beach. And this was the very end of summer and I was asleep. Tyler was naked and sweating, gritty with sand, his hair wet and stringy, hanging in his face. Tyler had been around a long time before we met. Tyler was pulling driftwood logs out of the surf and dragging them up the beach. In the wet sand, he'd already planted half circle logs, so they stood a few inches apart and as tall as his eyes. There were four logs, and when I woke up, I watched Tyler pull a fifth log up the beach. Tyler dug a hole under one end of the log, then lifted the other end until the log slid into the hole and stood there at a slight angle. You wake up at the beach. They were the only people, we were the only people at the beach. With a stick, Tyler drew a straight line in the sand several feet away. Tyler went back to straighten the log by stamping sand around its base. I was the only person watching this. Tyler called over. Do you know what time it is? I always wear a watch. Do you know what time it is? I asked, where? Right here, Tyler said, right now. It was 4.06 p.m. After a while, Tyler sat cross-legged in the shadow of the standing logs. Tyler sat there for a few minutes, got up and took a swim, pulled on a t-shirt and a pair of sweatpants and started to leave. I had to ask. I had to know what Tyler was doing while I was asleep. If I could wake up in a different place at a different time, could I wake up as a different person? I asked if Tyler was an artist. Tyler shrugged and showed me how the five standing logs were wider at the base. Tyler showed me the line he'd drawn in the sand and how he'd used the line to gauge the shadow cast by each log. Sometimes you wake up and have to ask yourself where you are. What Tyler had created was the shadow of a giant hand, only now the fingers were not spare too long and the thumb was too short. But he said how at exactly 4.30 the hand was perfect. The giant shadow hand was perfect for one minute and for one perfect minute minute Tyler had sat in the palm of a perfection he created himself. 
You wake up and you're nowhere. One minute was enough, Tyler said. A person had to work hard for it, but a minute of perfection was worth the effort. A moment was the most you could ever expect from perfection. You wake up and that's enough. His name was Tyler Durden and he was a movie projectionist with the union and he was a banquet waiter at a hotel downtown and he gave me his phone number and this is how we met. All the usual brain parasites are here tonight. Above and beyond always gets a big turnout. This is Peter, this is Aldo, this is Marcy. Hi. The introductions, everybody. This is Marla Singer, and this is her first time with us. Hi, Marla. At Above and Beyond, we start with the catch-up rap. The group isn't called Parasitic Brain Parasites. You'll never hear anyone say parasite. Everybody is always getting better. Oh, this new medication. Everyone's always just churn the corner. Still, everywhere there's a squint of the five-day headache. A woman wipes at involuntary tears. Everyone gets a name tag. And people you've met every Tuesday night for a year, they come at you. Handshake, hand ready, and their eyes on your name tag. I don't believe we've ever met. No one will ever say parasite. They'll say agent. They don't say cure. They'll say treatment. In catch-up rap, someone will say how the agent has spread into his spinal column, and now all of a sudden he'll have no control of his left hand. The agent, someone will say, has dried the lining of his brain, so now the brain pulls away from the inside of his skull, causing seizures. The last time I was here, the woman named Chloe announced the only good news she had. Chloe pushed herself to her feet against the wooden arms of her chair and said she no longer had any fear of death. Tonight, after the introductions and catch-up rap, a girl I don't know with a name tag that says Glenda says she's Chloe's sister and that at two in the morning last Tuesday, Chloe finally died. Oh, this should be so sweet. For two years, Chloe's been crying in my arms during hug time and now she's dead, dead in the ground, dead in an urn, mausoleum. Oh, the proof that one day you're thinking and holding yourself around and the next you're cold fertilizer, worm buffet. This is the amazing miracle of death, and it should be so sweet if it weren't for, oh, that one, Marla. Oh, and Marla's looking at me again, singled out amongst all the brain parasites. Liar, faker. Marla's the faker, you're the faker. Everyone around when they wince or twitch and fall down barking and the crotch of their jeans turns dark blue, well, it's all just a big act. Guided meditation all of a sudden won't take me anywhere tonight. Behind each of those seven palace doors, the green door, the orange door, Marla. The blue door, Marla stands there, liar. And the guided meditation through the cave of my power animal, my power animal is Marla, smoking her cigarette. Marla, rolling her eyes. Liar. Black hair and pillowy French lips. Faker. Italian dark leather sofa lips. You can't escape. Chloe was the genuine article. Chloe was the way Joni Mitchell's skeleton would look if you made it smile and walk around a party being extra special nice to everyone. Picture Chloe's popular skeleton, the size of an insect running through the vaults and galleries of her innards at two in the morning, her poles a siren overhead announcing, prepare for death in 10, in nine, in eight seconds. 
death will commence in seven, six. At night, Chloe ran around the maze of her own collapsing veins and burst tubes spraying hot lymph. Nerves surface as trip wires in the tissue. Abscesses swell in the tissue around her as height as hot white pearls. The overhead announcement, prepare to evacuate bowels in 10, in nine, eight, seven. Prepare to evacuate soul in 10, in 9, 8. Chloe splashing through the ankle deep backup of renal fluid from her failed kidneys. Death will commence in 5, 5, 4, 4. Around her, parasitic life spray paints her heart. 4, 3, 3. Two, Chloe climbs hand over hand up the curdled lining of her own throat. Death to commence in three, in two. Moonlight shines in through the open mouth. Prepare for the last breath. Now, evacuate. Now, soul clear of body. Now, death commences. Now, oh, this should be so sweet. The remembered warm jimble of Chloe still in my arms and Chloe dead somewhere. But no, I'm watched by Marla. In guided meditation, I open my arms to receive my inner child and the child is Marla smoking her cigarette. No white healing ball of light, liar, no chakras. Picture your chakras opening as flowers and the center of each is a slow motion explosion of sweet light. Liar. My chakras stay closed. When meditation ends, everyone is stretching and twisting their heads and pulling each other to their feet in preparation. Therapeutic physical contact. For the hug, I cross in three steps to stand against Marla, who looks up into my face as I watch everyone else for the cue. Let's all, the cue comes, embrace someone near us. My arms clamp around Carla, around Marla. Pick someone special to you tonight. Marla's cigarette hands are pinned to her waist. Tell this someone how you feel. Marla doesn't have testicular cancer. Marla doesn't have tuberculosis. She isn't dying. Okay, in that brainy, brain food philosophy way, we're all dying. But Marla isn't dying the way Chloe was dying. The cue comes, share yourself. So Marla, how do you like them apples? Share yourself completely. So Marla, get out. Get out, get out. Go ahead and cry if you have to. Marla stares up at me. Her eyes are brown. Her earlobes pucker around earring holes. No earrings. Her chap lips are frosted with dead skin. Go ahead and cry. You're not dying either, Marla says. Around us, couples stand sobbing, propping a, get propped against each other. You tell on me, Marla says, and I'll tell on you. Then we can split the week, I say. Marla can have bone disease, brain parasites, and tuberculosis. I'll keep testicular cancer, blood parasites, and organic brain dementia. Marla says, what about ascending bowel cancers? This girl has done her homework. We'll split bowel cancer. She gets it the first and the third Sunday of every month. No, Marla says. No, she wants it all. The cancers, the parasites. Marla's eyes narrow. She never dreamed she could feel so marvelous. She actually felt alive. Her skin was clearing up. All her life, she never saw a dead person. There was no real sense of life because she had nothing to contrast it with. Oh, but now there was dying and death and loss and grief.
grief, weeping and shuddering, terror and remorse. Now that she knows where we're all going, Marla feels every moment of her life. No, she wasn't leaving any group. Not and go back to the way life felt before, Marla says. I used to work in a funeral home to feel good about myself. Just the fact I was breathing. So what if I couldn't get a job in my field? Then go back to your funeral home, I say. Funerals are nothing compared to this, Marla says. Funerals are all about abstract ceremony. Here, you have real experience of death. Couples around the two of us are drying their tears, sniffing, patting each other on the back and letting go. We can't both come, I tell her. Then don't come. I need this. Then go to funerals. Everyone else has broken apart and they're joining hands for the closing prayer. I let Marla go. How long have you been coming here? The closing prayer. Two years. A man in the prayer circle takes my hand. A man takes Marla's hand. These prayers start and usually my breathing is blown. Oh, bless us. Oh, bless us in our anger and our fear. Two years? Marla tilts her head to whisper. Oh, bless us and hold us. Anyone who might have noticed me in two years has either died or recovered and never come back. Help us and help us. Okay, Marla says. Okay, okay, you can have testicular cancer. Big Bob, the big cheese bread crying all over me. Thanks. Bring us to our destiny. Bring us peace. Don't mention it. This is how I met Marla. The security task force guy explained everything to me. Baggage handlers can ignore a ticking suitcase. The security task force guy, he called baggage handlers throwers. Modern bombs don't tick, but a suitcase that vibrates. The baggage handlers, the throwers, they have to call the police. How I came to live with Tyler is because most airlines have this policy about vibrating baggage. My flight back from Dulles, I had everything in one bag. When you travel a lot, you learn to pack the same thing for every trip. Six white shirts, two black trousers, the bare minimum you need to survive. Traveling alarm clock, cordless electric razor, toothbrush, six pair underwear, six pair black socks. It turns out my suitcase was vibrating on departure from Dallas, according to the security task force guy. So the police took it off the flight. Everything was in that bag. My contact lens stuff, one red tie with blue stripes, one blue tie with red stripes. These are regimental stripes, not club tie stripes, and one solid red tie. A list of all these things used to hang on the inside of my bedroom door at home. Home was a condominium on the 15th floor of a high rise, a sort of filing cabinet for widows and young professionals. The marketing brochure promised a foot of concrete floor, ceiling, and wall between me and any adjacent stereo or turned up television. A foot of concrete and air conditioning. You couldn't open the windows, so even with maple flooring and dimmer switches, all 1,700 airtight feet would smell like the last meal you cooked on your last trip to the bathroom. Yeah. There was the butcher block countertops and low voltage track lighting. Still, a foot of concrete is important when your next door neighbor lets the battery on her hearing aid go and has to watch her game shows at full blast. Or when a volcanic blast of burning gas and debris that used to be your living room set and personal effects blows 
out of your floor to ceiling windows and sails down flaming to leave just your condo, only yours, a gutted, charred concrete hole in the cliff side of the building. These things happen. Everything, including your set of hand-blown green glass dishes with the tiny bubbles and imperfections, little bits of sand, proof they were carved by the honest, simple, hardworking, indigenous, aboriginal peoples of wherever, well, these dishes all get blown out by the blast. Picture the floor to ceiling drapes blown out and flaming to shreds in the hot wind. 15 floors over the city, this stuff comes flaming and bashing and shattering down on everyone's car. Me, while I'm heading west, asleep at math point eighty three or 455 miles an hour, true airspeed, the FBI is bomb squatting my suitcase on a vacation runway back at Dallas. Nine times out of 10, the security task force guy says, the vibration is an electric razor. This was my cordless electric razor. The other time it's a vibrating dildo. The security task force guy told me this. This was at my destination without my suitcase where I was about to cab it home and find my flannel sheet shredded on the ground. Imagine the task force guy says, telling a passenger on arrival that a dildo kept her baggage on the East Coast. Sometimes it's even a man. It's airline policy not to imply ownership in the event of a dildo. Use the indefinite article, a dildo, never your dildo. Never ever say the dildo accidentally trimmed itself on. A dildo activated itself and created an emergency situation that required evacuating your baggage. Rain was falling when I woke up from my connection to Stapleton. Rain was falling when I woke up on our approach to home. An announcement told us to please take this opportunity to check around our seats for any personal belongings we might have left behind. Then the announcement said my name. Would I please meet with the airline representative waiting at the gate? I set my watch back three hours and it was still after midnight. There was an airline representative at the gate and there was a security task force guy to say, ha, your electric razor kept your checked baggage at Dulles. The task force guy called my baggage handlers throwers. Then he called them rampers. To prove things could be worse, the guy told me that at least it wasn't a dildo. Then maybe because I'm a guy and he's a guy and it's one o'clock in the morning, maybe to make me laugh, the guy said industry slang for flight attendant was space waitress or air mattress. It looked like the guy was wearing a pilot's uniform, white shirt with little epaulets and a blue tie. My luggage had just been cleared he said, and would arrive the next day. The security guy asked my name and address and phone number, and then he asked me what the difference between a condom and a cockpit was. You can only get one prick into a condom, he said. I cabbed home on my last 10 bucks. The local police had been asking a lot of questions too. My electric razor, which wasn't a bomb, was still three time zones behind me. Something, which was a bomb, a big bomb, had blasted a, cle a clever Najurda coffee tables in the shape of a lime green yin and an orange yang that fit together to make a circle. Well, they were splinters now. My Haparanda sofa group with the orange slip covers designed by Erica Picari, it was trash now. And I wasn't the only slave to my nesting instinct. The people I know who used to sit in the bathroom with pornography, now they sit in the bathroom with their Ikea furniture catalog. We all have the same Johannesburg armchair in this dream green stripe pattern. Mine fell 15 stories 
burning into a fountain. We all have the same wrist lamp, har paper lamps made from wire and environmentally friendly unbleached paper. Mine are confetti. All that sitting in the bathroom, the Ale cutlery service, stainless steel, dishwasher safe, the Vild Hall clock made of galvanized steel. Oh, I had to have that. The Kip Slick shelving unit. Oh, yeah. And like box hats. And like hat boxes. Yes. The street outside my high rise was sparkling and scattered with all of this. The Mamela quilt cover set designed by Thomas Arlia and available in the following. Orchid, fuchsia, cobalt, ebony, jet, eggshell, or heather. It took my whole life to buy this stuff. The easy care textured lacquer of my calyx occasional tables, my stead nesting tables. You buy furniture. You tell yourself, this is the last sofa I'll ever need in my life. You buy the sofa. Then for a couple of years, you're satisfied that no matter what goes wrong, at least you've got your sofa issue handled. Then the right set of dishes, then the perfect bed, the drapes, the rug. Then you're trapped in your lovely nest and the things that the things you used to own, now they own you. Until I got home from the airport, the doorman steps out of the shadows to say, there's been an accident. The police, they were here and asked a lot of questions. The police think maybe it was the gas. Maybe the pilot light on the stove went out or a burner was left on leaking gas and the gas rose to the ceiling and the gas filled the condo from the ceiling to floor in every room. The condo was 1,700 square feet with high ceilings. And for days and days, the gas must have leaked until every room was full. When the rooms were filled to the floor, the compressor at the base of the refrigerator clicked on detonation. The floor to ceiling windows and their aluminum frames went out and the sofas and the lamps and dishes and sheet sets in flames and high school annuals and the diplomas and telephone. Everything blasting out from the 15th floor in a, sol in a sort of solar flare. Oh, not my refrigerator. I collected shelves full of different mustards some stone ground, some English pub style. There were 14 different flavors of fat-free salad dressing and seven kinds of capers. I know, I know, a house full of condiments and no real food. The doorman blew his nose and something went into his handkerchief with a good slap and a pitch into the catcher's mitt. You could go up to the 15th floor and the doorman said, but nobody could go into the unit. Police orders. The police had been asking, did I have an old girlfriend who'd want to do this? Or made, had I made an enemy of somebody who had access to dynamite? It wasn't worth going up, the doorman said. All that's left is the concrete shell. The police hadn't ruled out arson. No one had smelled gas. The doorman raised an eyebrow. This guy spent his time flirting with the day maids and nurses who worked in the big units on the top floor and waited in the lobby chairs for their rides after work. Three years I lived here and the doorman still sat reading his Elegry Queen magazine every night while I shifted packages and bags to unlock the front door and let myself in. The doorman raises an eyebrow and says how some people will go on a long trip and leave a candle, a long, long candle, burning in a big puddle of gasoline. People with financial difficulties do this stuff. People who want out from under. I asked to use the lobby phone. A lot of young people try to impress the world and buy too many things, the doorman said. I called Tyler. The phone rang in Tyler's rented house on Paper Street. 
Oh, Tyler, please deliver me. And the phone rang. The doorman leaned into my shoulder and said, a lot of young people don't know what they really want. Oh, Tyler, please rescue me. And the phone rang. Young people, they think they want the whole world. Deliver me from Swedish furniture. Deliver me from clever art. And the phone rang and Tyler answered. If you don't know what you want, the doorman said, you end up with a lot you don't. I may never be, com I may never be complete. I may never be content. I may never be perfect. Deliver me, Tyler, from being perfect and complete. Tyler and I agreed to meet at a bar. The doorman asked for a number where the police could reach me. It was still raining. My Audi was still parked in the lot. But a dark pearl halogen torcher was speared through the windshield. Tyler and I, we met and drank a lot of beer. And Tyler said, yes, I could move in with him, but I would have to do him a favor. The next day, my suitcase would arrive with the bare minimum, six shirts, six pair of underwear. There, drunk in a bar where no one was watching and no one would care, I asked Tyler what he wanted me to do. Tyler says, I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Two screens into my demo to Microsoft, I taste blood and I have to start swallowing. My boss doesn't know the material, but he won't let me run the demo with a black eye and half my face swollen from the stitches inside my cheek. The stitches have come loose and I can feel them with my tongue against the inside of my cheek. Picture snarled fishing line on the beach. I can picture them as the black stitches on a dog after it's been fixed and I keep swallowing blood. My boss is making the presentation for my script and I'm running the laptop projector. So I'm off to one side of the room in the dark. More of my lips are sticky with blood as I try to lick the blood off. And when the lights come up, I will turn the consultants, Ellen and Walter, to Norbert and Linda from Microsoft and say, thank you for coming. My mouth shining with blood and blood coming and blood climbing the cracks between my teeth. You can swallow about a pint of blood before you're sick. Fight Club is tomorrow and I'm not going to miss Fight Club. Before the presentation, Walter from Microsoft smiles his steam shovel jaw like a marketing tool tan the color of barbecued potato chip. Walter, with his signet ring, shakes my hand, wrapped in his smooth, soft hand, and says, I hate to see what happened to the other guy. The first rule about, flight, about Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. I tell Walter I fell. I did this to myself. Before the presentation, when I sat across from my boss telling him where in the script each slide cues and when I wanted to run the video segment, my boss said, what do you get yourself into every weekend? I just don't wanna die without a few scars, I say. It's nothing anymore to have a beautiful stock body. You can see those cars that are completely stock cherry right out of the dealer's showroom in 1955. I always think, what a waste. My second, the second rule about Fight Club is, you don't talk about Fight Club. Maybe at lunch, the waiter comes to your table and the waiter has two black eyes of a giant panda from Fight Club last weekend when you saw him get his head pinched between, between the concrete floor and the knee of a 200 pound stock boy who kept slamming a fist into the bridge of the waiter's nose again and again. In flat heart packing sounds, you could hear over the yelling until the waiter caught enough breath and sprayed blood to say, stop.
You don't say anything because Fight Club exists only in the hours between when Fight, fight Club starts and when Fight Club ends. You saw the kid who works in the copy center. A month ago, you saw this kid who can't remember to three hole punch in order or put colored slip sheets between the copy packets. But this kid was a god for 10 minutes when you saw him kick the air out of the account re representative twice his size, then land the man and pound him limp until the kid had to stop. That's the third rule in Fight Club. When someone says stop or goes limp, even if he's just faking it, the fight is over. Every time you see this kid, you can't tell him what a great fight he had. Only two guys to a fight, one fight at a time. They fight without shirts or shoes. The fights go as long as they have to. Those are the other rules of Fight Club. Who, who guys aren't, that reads weird. Who guys are in Fight Club is not who they are in real life. Even if you told the kid in the copy center that he had a good fight, you wouldn't be talking to the same man. Who I am in Fight Club is not someone my boss knows. After a night in Fight Club, everything in the real world gets volume trimmed down. Nothing can piss you off. Your word is law. And if other people break that law or question you, even that doesn't piss you off. In the real world, I'm calling, I'm recalling a campaign coordinator in a shirt and tie sitting in a dark sitting in the dark with a mouthful of blood and changing the overheads and slides as my boss tells Microsoft how he chose a particular shade of pale cornflower blue for an icon. The first fight club was just Tyler and I pounding on each other. It used to be enough that when I came home angry and knowing that my life wasn't towing my five-year plan, I could clean my condominium or detail my car. Someday, I'd be dead without a scar, and there would be a really nice condo and car. Really, really nice until the dust settled or the next owner. Nothing is static. Even the Mona Lisa is falling apart. Since Fight Club, I can wiggle half the teeth in my jaw. Maybe self-improvement isn't the answer. Tyler never knew his father. Maybe self-destruction is the answer. Tyler and I still go to Fight Club together. Fight Club is in the basement of a bar now, after the bar closes on Saturday night, and every week you go and there's more guys there. Tyler gets under one light in the middle of the black concrete basement and he can see the light flickering back out of the dark in a hundred pairs of eyes. First thing Tyler yells is, this first rule about Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. The second rule about Fight Club, Tyler yells, is you don't talk about Fight Club. Me? I only knew my dad for about six years, but I don't remember anything. My dad, he starts a new family in a new town about every six years. This isn't so much like a family as it's like he sets up a franchise. What you see at Fight Club is a generation of men raised by women. Tyler standing under one light in the after midnight blackness of a basement full of men. Tyler runs through the other rules. Two men per fight, one fight at a time, no shoes, no shirts. Fights go on as long as they have to. And the seventh rule, Tyler yells, is if this is your first night at Fight Club, you have to fight. Fight Club is not football on television. You aren't watching a bunch of men you don't know halfway around the world 
feeding on each other live by satellite in a two pin, in a two, with a two minute delay. Commercials pitching beer every 10 minutes and a pause now for station identification. After you've been to Fight Club, watching football on television is watching pornography when you could be having great sex. Fight Club gets to be your reason for going to the gym and keeping your hair cut short and cutting your nails. The gyms you go to are crowded with guys trying to look like men as if being a man means looking the way a sculptor or an art director says. Like Tyler says, even a souffle looks pumped. My father never went to college, so it was really important I go to college. After college, I called him long distance and said, now what? My dad didn't know. When I got a job and turned 25 long distance, I said, now what? My dad didn't know. So he said, get married. I'm a 30 year old boy and I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer I need. What happens at Fight Club doesn't happen in words. Some guys need a fight every week. This week, Tyler says it's the first 50 guys through the door and that's it. No more. Last week, I tapped a guy and he and I got on the list for a fight. This guy must have had a bad week. Got both my arms behind my head in a full Nelson and rammed my face into the concrete floor until my teeth bit open the inside of my cheek and my eye was swollen shut and was bleeding and after I said stop I could look down and there was a print of half my face in blood on the floor Tyler stood next to me both of us looking down at the big O of my mouth with blood all around it and the little slit of my eye staring up at us from the floor and Tyler says cool I shake the guy's hand and say, good fight. This guy, he says, how about next week? I try to smile against all the swelling and I say, look at me. How about next month? You aren't alive anywhere like you're alive at Fight Club. When it's you and one other guy under that one light in the middle of all those watching, Fight Club isn't about winning or losing fights. Fight Club isn't about words. You see a guy come to Fight Club for the first time and his ass is a loaf of white bread. You see this same guy here six months later and he looks carved out of wood. This guy trusts himself to handle anything. There's grunting and noise at Fight Club like at the gym, but Fight Club isn't about looking good. There's hysterical shouting in tongues like at a church. And when you wake up on Sunday afternoon, you feel saved. After my last fight, the guy who fought me mopped the floor while I called my insurance to pre-approve a visit to the emergency room. At the hospital, Tyler tells them I fell down. Sometimes Tyler speaks for me. I did this to myself. Outside, the sun is coming up. You don't talk about Fight Club because except for five hours from two until seven on Sunday morning, Fight Club doesn't exist. When we invented Fight Club, Tyler and I, neither of us had ever been in a fight before. If you've never been in a fight, you wonder about, if you never been in a fight, you wonder about getting hurt, about what you're capable of doing against another man. I was the first guy Tyler ever felt safe enough to ask, and we were both drunk in a bar where no one would care. So Tyler says, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. I didn't want to, but Tyler explained it all about not wanting to die without any scars, about being tired of watching only professionals fight and wanting to know more about himself, about self-destruction. At the time, my life just seemed too complete and maybe we have to break everything to make something better out of ourselves. 
I looked around and said, okay, okay, I say, but outside in the parking lot. So we went outside and I asked if Tyler wanted it in the face or in the stomach. Tyler said, surprise me. I said, I'd never hit anybody. Tyler says, so go crazy, man. I said, close your eyes. Tyler said, no. Like every guy on his first fight in Fight Club, I breathed in and swung my fist in a roundhouse at Tyler's jaw, like in every cowboy movie we'd ever seen. And me, my first connection connected with the side of, my fist connected with the side of Tyler's neck. Shit, I said, that didn't count. I want to try it again. Tyler said, yeah, it counted and hit me straight on. Pow, just like a cartoon boxing glove on a spring on a Saturday morning cartoon, right in the middle of my chest. And I fell back against a car. We both stood there, Tyler rubbing the side of his neck and me holding a hand on my chest. Both of us knowing we'd gotten somewhere we'd never been and like the cat and mouse in cartoons, we were still alive and wanted to see how far we could take this thing and still be alive. Tyler said, cool. I said, hit me again. Tyler said, no, you hit me. So I hit him. A girl's wide roundhouse to the right under his ear and Tyler shoved me back and stomped the heel of his shoe in my stomach. What happened next and after that didn't happen in words, but the bar closed and people came out and shouted around us in the parking lot. Instead of Tyler, I felt finally I could get my hands on everything in the world that didn't work. My cleaning that came back with the collar buttons broken, the bank that says I'm hundreds of dollars overdrawn, my job or my boss got on my computer and fiddled with my DOS exec, ex execute commands. And Marla Singer, who stole the support groups from me. Nothing was solved when the fight was over, but nothing mattered. The first night we fought was a Sunday night, and Tyler hadn't shaved all weekend, so my knuckles burned raw from his weekend beard. Lying on our backs in the parking lot, staring up one star that came through the streetlights, I asked Tyler what he'd been fighting. Tyler said, his father. Maybe we didn't need a father to complete ourselves. There's nothing personal about who you fight in Fight Club. You fight to fight. You're not supposed to talk about Fight Club, but we talked and for the next couple of weeks, guys met in that parking lot after the bar had closed. And by the time it got cold, another bar offered the basement where we meet now. When Fight Club meets, Tyler gives the rules. He and I decided. Most of you, Tyler yells in the cone of light in the center of the basement full of men. You're here because someone broke the rules. Somebody told you about Fight Club. Tyler says, well, you better stop talking or you better start another Fight Club because next week you put your name on a list when you get here and only the first 50 names on that list get in. If you get in, you set up your fight right away if you want a fight. If you don't want to fight, there are guys who do. So maybe you should just stay at home. If this is your first night at Fight Club, Tyler yells, you have to fight. Most guys are at Fight Club because of something they're too scared to fight. After a few fights, you're afraid a lot less. A lot of the best, a lot of best friends meet for the first time at Fight Club. Now, I go to meetings or conferences and see faces at conference tables, accountants and junior executives or attorneys with broken noses spreading out like an eggplant under the edges of band-aids, or they have a couple of stitches under an eye or a jaw wired shut. These are the quiet young men who listen until it's time to decide. We nod to each other. Later, 
My boss will ask me how I know so many of these men guys. According to my boss, there are fewer and fewer gentlemen in business and more thugs. The demo goes on. Walter from Microsoft catches my eye. Here's a young guy with perfect teeth and clear skin and the kind of job you bother to write the alumni magazine about getting. You know, he was too young to fight in any wars, and if his parents weren't divorced, his father was never home. And here he's looking at me with half my face clean shaven and half a leering bruise hidden in the dark, blood shining on my lips. And maybe Walter's thinking about a meatless, pain-free potluck he went to last weekend or the ozone or the earth's desperate need to stop cruel product testing on animals. But probably he's not. One morning, there's the dead jellyfish of a used condom floating in the toilet. This is how Tyler meets Marla. I get up to take a leak and there against the sort of cave paintings of a dirt in a toilet bowl is this. You have to wonder, what does sperm think? This, this is the vagina vault. What's happening here? All night long, I dreamed I was humping Marla Singer. Marla Singer smoking her cigarette. Marla Singer rolling her eyes. I wake up alone in my own bed and the door to Tyler's room is closed. The door to Tyler's room is never closed. All night it was raining. The shingles on the roof blister, buckle, curl. And the rain comes through and collects on top of the ceiling plaster and drips down through the light fixtures. When it's raining, we have to pull the fuses. You don't dare turn out the lights. You don't dare turn on the lights. The house that Tyler rents, it has three stories in a basement. We carry around candles. It has pantries and screens, sleeping porches, and stained glass windows on the stairway landing. There are bay windows with window seats in the parlor. The baseboard moldings are carved and varnished and 18 inches high. The rain trickles down through the house and everything wooden swells and shrinks and the nails and everything wooden. The floors and baseboards and window casings the nails inch out and rust. Everywhere there are rusted nails to step on or snag your elbow on. And there's only one bathroom for seven bedrooms. And now there's a used condom. The house is waiting for something, a zoning change or a will to come out of probate and then it'll be torn down. I asked Tyler how long he's been here and he said about six weeks. Before the dawn of time, there was an owner who collected lifetime stacks of the National Geographic and Reader's Digest. Big teetering stacks of magazines that get taller every time it rains. Tyler says the last tenant used to fold the glossy magazine pages for cocaine envelopes. There's no lock on the front door from when the police or whoever kicked in the door. There's nine layers of wallpaper swelling on the dining room walls, flowers under stripes, under flowers, under birds, under a grass cloth. Our only neighbors are a closed machine shop and across the street, a block long warehouse. Inside the house, there's a closet with seven foot rollers for rolling up dance game tablecloths so they never have to be creased. There's a cedar lined refrigerated fur closet. The tile in the bathroom is painted with little flowers, nicer than most everybody's wedding china. And there's a used condom in the toilet. I've been living with Tyler about a month. Tyler comes to breakfast with hickeys sucked all over his neck and chest. And I'm reading through an old Reader's Digest magazine. This is the perfect house for dealing drugs. There are no neighbors. There's nothing else on Paper Street except for warehouses and the pulp mill. 
the fart smell of steam from the paper mill and the hamster cage smell of wood chips and orange pyramids around the mill. This is the perfect house for dealing drugs because a bazillion trucks drive down Paper Street every day. But at night, Tyler and I are alone for a half mile in every direction. I found stacks and stacks of Reader's Digest in the basement, and now there's a pile of Reader's Digest in every room. Life in these United States. Laughter is the best medicine. Stacks of magazines are only are about the only furniture. In the oldest magazines, there's a series of articles where organs in the human body talk about themselves in the first person. I'm Jane's uterus. I'm Joe's prostate. No kidding. And Tyler comes to the kitchen table with his hickeys and no shirt and says, blah, 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 blah. He met Marla Singer last night and they had sex. Hearing this, I am totally Joel's gallbladder. All of this is my fault. Sometimes you do something and you get screwed. Sometimes it's the things you don't do and you get screwed. Last night, I called Marla. We've worked out a system, so if I want to go to a support group, I can call Marla and see if she's planning to go. Melanoma was last night and I felt a little down. Marla lives at the Regent Hotel, which is nothing but brown bricks held together with sleaze, where all the mattresses are sealed inside slippery plastic covers. So many people go there to die. You sit on any bed the wrong way and you and the sheets and blankets slide right to the floor. I called Marla at the Regent Hotel to see if she was going to melanoma. Marla answered in slow motion. This wasn't a for real suicide, Marla said. This was probably just one of those cry for help things, but she had taken too many Xanax. Picture going over to the Regent Hotel to watch Marla throw herself around her crummy room saying, I'm dying, dying, I'm dying, dying, dying. Ing, dying, this would go on for hours. So she was staying home tonight, right? She was doing the big death thing, Marla told me. I should get a move on if I wanted to watch. Thanks anyway, I said, but I had other plans. That's okay, Marla said. She could die just as well watching television. Marla just hoped there would be something worth watching. And I ran off to melanoma. I came home early. I slept. And now at breakfast the next morning, Tyler is sitting here covered in hickeys and says, Marla is some twisted bitch, but he likes that a lot. After melanoma last night, I came home and went to sleep and dreamed I was humping and humping and humping Marla Singer. And this morning, listening to Tyler, I pretend to read the Reader's Digest. A twisted bitch. I could have told you that. Reader's Digest. Humor in uniform. I'm Joe's raging bile duct. The thing Marla said to him last night, Tyler says, no girls ever talk to him that way. I'm Joe's grinding teeth. I'm Joe's inflamed flaring nostrils. After Tyler and Marla had sex about 10 times, Tyler says, Marla said she wanted to get pregnant. Marla said she wanted to have Tyler's abortion. I'm Joe's white knuckles. How could Tyler not fall for that? The night before last, Tyler sat up alone, splicing sex organs into Snow White. How could I compete for Tyler's attention? I'm Joe's enraged, inflamed sense of rejection. What's worse is this is all my fault. After I went to sleep last night, Tyler tells me he came home from his shift as a banquet waiter and Marla called again from the Regent Hotel. This was it, Marla said. 
the tunnel, the light leading her down the tunnel. The death experience was so cool. Marla wanted me to hear her describe it as she lifted out of her body and floated up. Marla didn't know if her spirit could use the telephone, but she wanted someone to at least hear her last breath. No, but no. Tyler answers the phone and misunderstands the whole situation. They've never met, so Tyler thinks it's a bad thing that Marla is about to die. It's nothing of the kind. It's none of Tyler's business, but Tyler calls the police and Tyler races over to the Regent Hotel. Now, According to the ancient Chinese custom we all learned from television, Tyler is responsible for Marla forever because Tyler saved Marla's life. If I had only wasted a couple of minutes and gone over to watch Marla die, then none of this would have happened. Tyler tells me how Marla lives in room 8G on the top floor of the Regent Hotel. Up eight flights of stairs and down a noisy hallway with canned television laughter coming through the doors. Every couple of seconds, an actress screams or actress dies screaming in a rattle in a rattle of bullets. Tyler gets to the end of the hallway, and even before he knocks, a thin, thin buttermilk sallow arm slingshots out the door of the room. H.G. grabs his wrist and yanks Tyler inside. I bury myself in Reader's Digest. Even as Marla yanks Tyler into her room, Tyler can hear brake squeals and sirens collecting out in front of the Regent Hotel. On the dresser, there's a dildo made of the same soft pink plastic as a million Barbie dolls. And for a moment, Tyler can picture millions of baby dolls and Barbie dolls and dildos injection molded and coming off the same assembly line in Taiwan. Marla looks at Tyler, looking at her dildo, and she rolls her eyes and says, don't be afraid. It's not a threat to you. Marla shoves Tyler back out in the hallway and she says she's sorry, but he shouldn't have called the police and that's probably the police downstairs right now. In the hallway, Marla locks the door to 8G and shoves Tyler toward the stairs. On the stairs, Tyler and Marla flatten against the wall as police and paramedics charge by with oxygen, asking which door will be 8G. Marla tells them the door at the end of the hall. Marla shouts to the police that the girl who lives in 8G used to be a lovely, charming girl, but the girl is a monster bitch monster. The girl is infectious, human waste, and she's confused and afraid to commit to the wrong thing. So she won't commit to anything. The girl in AG has no faith in herself, Marla shouts. And she's worried that as she grows older, she'll have fewer and fewer options. Marla shouts, good luck. The police pile up the locked door to H.G. and Marla and Tyler hurry down to the lobby. Behind them, a policeman is yelling at the door. Let us help you, Miss Singer. You have every reason to live. Just let us in, Marla, and we can help you with your problems. Marla and Tyler rushed out into the street. Tyler got Marla into a cab. And high up on the eighth floor of the hotel, Tyler could see shadows moving back and forth across the windows of Marla's room. Out on the freeway, with all the lights and the other cars, six lanes of traffic racing toward the vanishing point, Marla tells Tyler he has to keep her up all night. If Marla ever falls asleep, she'll die. A lot of people wanted Marla dead, she told Tyler. These people were already dead and on the other side. And at night, they called on the telephone. Marla would go to bars and hear the bar bartender calling her name. And when she took the call, the line was dead. Tyler and Marla, they were up almost all night in the room next to mine. When Tyler woke up, Marla had disappeared back to the Regent Hotel. I tell Ty Tyler, Marla Singer doesn't need a lover. She needs a caseworker, Tyler says. 
Don't call this love. Long story short, now Marla's out to ruin another part of my life. Ever since college, I make friends. They get married, I lose friends. Fine. Neat, I say. Tyler asks, is this a problem for me? I'm Joe's clenching bowels. No, I say, it's fine. Put a gun to my head and paint the wall with my brains. Just great, I say. Really? How you guys doing in chat? We'll probably stop here because the next chapter is pretty long and we have like, we're almost at two hours. Thank you guys for being here. So what do you guys think so far? It's really, um, it's a little bit different than the movie, right? I mean, you're getting into the characters' heads a lot. And next time I will not be using this chair. <laughs> So I'm glad you guys came. And um, a lot of the reason that I don't talk in like the lives and say a lot of stuff is because on playback, I'm not at a point where I'm editing out like all the stuff I'm saying. So on playback, people don't want like people that just want to hear the book and don't know about um, like our little community. They don't want to hear like all this talking <laughs> so yeah and sometimes like I said in the beginning they don't know we're live so I hope you guys enjoyed it thank you guys so much for being here um well what we'll probably do I don't know if I'll be able to do the second part this week but definitely you know I would say Monday we have a lot going on in true crime right now um but look out for my um you know like scheduled live we'll do this live also i'll put it in a playlist and when it's done you just start at the beginning of the playlist and it'll be like eight hours of reading a book um when it's all done and said and done thank you so much thank you karen morton mama libra scale we'll Thank you guys for being here. I hope the sound was good because on my end, it kind of, I heard a lot of my chair and I don't know if I like that. So I hope it's not like that um, on the playback. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys could join me here. TN Bowls, thank you so much. Um. Thank you guys. So what I'll do is end it now. I really, really appreciate you guys being here, like I said, and um, I appreciate the support. Have a really good night. Talk to you guys soon. Good night.